you can kind of tell from a little of that career story that I've always been doing things without having the answers. I've always been trying to take opportunities without having a clear roadmap or having this kind of really well thought out plan of how it's going to go. And I believe there's a huge magic in, in the opportunity of trying, in the opportunity of just putting one foot in front of another, in the opportunity of just, you know, asking a lot of questions along the way and being curious. Welcome back to another edition of COVID-19 from Crisis to Creation here on Mentor TV. I'm Patricia Fakobekali, your host. What is perfection anyway? I mean, does it sometimes happen to you that you look at a person and go, wow, they are so perfect. Whatever they say, what they do, how they handle things in life, they always seem to have a plan. I mean, be it professionally or with their families, their partners, their kids, they always seem to come out on top. So I ask myself, how do they do it? Are they lucky? Is it DNA? Do they have the Midas touch? Or have they perhaps learned the art of letting go of the idea that perfectionism is actually possible? That is a very important question. This is why I invited Emma Isaacs to the show. She wrote a book called Winging It, Stop Thinking, Start Doing. Emma, Superwoman, come into the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> not at all, not at all. It's great to be here. Thank you. Well, Emma, listen, I read your book from top to toe, cover to cover, and usually I ask my guests at the end of our conversation, what are the key learnings about your path or your 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 sector, whatever you are good at, but your book is just full of key learnings. Let me ask you, first of all, how did the idea come about to write a book about winging it? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, so a little about my backstory. Um, you might hear from my accent. I'm originally Australian, so I was born and raised in Sydney, Australia. I moved to Los Angeles in California, where I now live. Um, I've been here for five years now, um, and we love it here. Um, I'm what you might call a career entrepreneur. So that means that I've never actually worked for anyone else before. And that ideal in itself um, kind of lends itself to winging it because when you're not reliant on a paycheck, you have to learn a bunch of skills on the fly of how you're going to build your career and build your reputation and you know, ultimately build yourself. So I, um, you know, I had a beautiful childhood back in Australia, um, very, very normal upbringing. I come from a very, very academic family. So of all my cousins, I'm the only one without a university degree because I went to university and I dropped out of after only six months, um, you know, I really stumbled into the career of entrepreneurship. I had my first company when I was 18 years old. And, you know, this because you read the book, um, but I built that business into a really beautiful small business of about 40 people. We won a host of awards. Um, you know, it was a really great grounding and foundation for me in business, you know, what it meant to turn a profit, what it meant to build a culture in your business, what it meant to serve your customers, all of those things I learned in my first company. Um, I then uh, exited that business successfully and sold my shares to my business partner. And I got invited to this networking event and it was run by a group called Business Chicks. And, yeah. um, you know, we're, we're all from different, um, all parts of the globe here, but uh, for, for us, the word chick is quite a derogatory term. You know, it's sort of, um, I said, you know, it's insulting to women and it's derogatory to women. And I, I don't want to call myself a chick. And, you know, she said, listen, get over yourself and come along and experience this thing. So I, I did it. And I remember walking into that room and falling head over heels in love with the concept. Um, women were very, very, uh, how do I describe it? Very open and willing to help each other. And they were sort of, um, you know, leaning forward and saying, what can I do for you? And how do you need help? And all these sort of concepts that are very, very different to the networking that perhaps I'd known up until that point where you had to put on your suit and say the right things and not look silly and pretend like you had it all together, right? So um, I loved it and I um, ended up going back to my recruitment company and passing my credit card around to all of my employees and I said, everyone become a member of this organisation and let's get some tickets to the next event. We went along to that next event and I heard the business was for sale. So I ran up to the lady at the end and I said, I, I, I want to do this. I want to buy this business. I have no idea what I'm doing. I've never run an event before in my life. I don't know how to you know, start or build a membership organization, but I feel drawn to this and I ended up buying the business six months later. So 
you can kind of tell from a little of that career story that I've always been doing things without having the answers. I've always been trying to take opportunities without having a clear roadmap or having this kind of really well thought out plan of how it's going to go. I believe there's a huge magic in in the opportunity of trying, in the opportunity of just putting one foot in front of another, in the opportunity of just, you know, asking a lot of questions along the way and being curious and being open-minded. And so I suppose that to answer your question is where the idea of we came along because it's all those philosophies I've had in terms of how I run my life and, and my companies up until this point. Yeah, and I really got the feeling when I read that book that is genuinely you um, writing about your own experiences. And the great thing is that you also quote a lot of very important and famous people in, and they put really the concept that you're describing uh, into a few words and it kind of really hits home. But I had the feeling all the way through that you're genuinely talking about your experience. So in terms of winging it, okay, uh, how can one really define it apart from just saying, okay, just don't have a plan, walk into something, you're young, you're beautiful, be confident, just <laughs> go for it. Because I think there is a little bit more to it. Of course, of course. And it really comes in the practicing, right? It's not as if I was born with this huge, uh, you know, deep well of confidence, you know, I've had to work on it. I've, I've certainly in my life experienced many, many, many moments. I'm sure you're the same of having imposter syndrome. You get placed at a table or placed in a room as, you know, highly successful people. And you think, what am I doing here? You know? So for me, um, this art of winging it or the way I've built my, my re reputation, I suppose, in my career and my businesses up until this point has been through practicing having confidence and practicing putting myself into uncomfortable situations and practicing saying yes and figuring out the rest as we go and practicing 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 so it's not something that you ever arrive at <laughs> you don't suddenly wake up one morning and say oh i've got it all and here we go i've got all the confidence in the world to tackle my dreams it takes actual intention and effort and action in terms of building your confidence and trying new things so for me that's just been you know one of the ways i've done it's about experimenting every single day and trying to make today better than yesterday and you know not looking too far into the future because i think sometimes when we have this whole idea of i want to be here by then you know it, it really derails our plans in the moment yeah. and you know what i have been in business for over 20 years now and i've seen how the planning cycles have been shortened you know perhaps You know, 20 years ago, we could kind of look into 10 years into the future and say, I want to be here. But, you know, with the advent of technology, with the, with the political <laughs> storm that we all find ourselves in on a global scale, with the health position we find ourselves on on a global scale with this pandemic, you know, being able to see in the future, you know, in a very, very long term type of way is very, very, it's, it's difficult. So anyone who tells that they can build a plan, you know, really clear, perfect plan, they're making it up, you know, and, and, and to your point, it's a beautiful point you make. You know, I have been lucky to work alongside some of the world's most incredible business leaders and visionaries and celebrities. And, you know, when I started working with them 15 years ago, um, you know, I, I thought that they had it all together and they had this perfect plan. And then when I got to spend meaningful time with people like Ariana Huffington and Richard Branson and Sir Bob Geldof and oh, Gloria Steinem and all these incredible luminaries, you know, I realized that what um, the common thread was for them. They didn't have it figured out, but they had built their confidence to ask questions. They had been very, very curious. They had listened more than they spoke. And all these sort of things came to me as this theme of, um, you know, they are just trying things and they're backing themselves into situations. So that's, yeah. You know, you know what I'm talking about. You yeah, know. no, but this is, this, is, this is so crucial because, I mean, in your very first chapter, Just Start, You know, um, there you you mentioned Jeff Bezos and Amazon and the way that they make decision with decisions with only 70% of the information available. And, and Jeff himself apparently said, you know, if you're waiting for 90% of the information to make an informed decision, you are definitely behind the curve. So that's yes. the gist of what, um, what he said. And I think it is so crucial to just go with what you think is actually you know, possible in the moment that you have that and that everybody really is often doing the, you know, fake it till you make it. And it doesn't matter how intellectual, how high the income bracket, it is a, a question of being flexible in the moment. And coming to your point as well, Emma, that, uh, you know, a long-term plan, I think one has to see, you know, the line at the end or the light at the end of the tunnel. Yes. 
but the flexibility, the adaptability to, you know, the velocity of the changes that are happening over and over and over again and faster again in our new world is really what keeps us constantly really in a zone that is not very comfortable and demands us being, you know, <laughs> actually quite adaptable or just think. Yes, absolutely. And if you look at any successful person, one of the qualities that they've been able to cultivate, I suppose, is this idea of resilience. You know, they understand, they head into opportunities knowing that there's a good chance they might fail at them, but they've been able to pick themselves up, dust themselves off and try again. And so I I get obsessed with this idea of resilience and how we build it not only in ourselves, but in our children. And I don't for one moment um, pretend to have it all figured out when it comes to that. But I think we have a lot to learn from these people who have reinvented themselves and have tried lots of different things. And, you know, Branson is a beautiful example of that because he goes into businesses knowing full well that so many of them are going to fail, but that's not the point. The point is not to get it right and get it perfect. The point is to experiment and to, you know, have a go and to learn more and to, we, we say, build the plane while it's flying, you know, because until, if you wait until everything is perfect and you wait until you have this, you know, 80 page business plan and you wait until you have enough money, you have enough education, you have the bigger network, you the kids have left home, you're going to be waiting for a long time so all we have is this moment you know and that's just not that's not self-help that is that's universal law it's all we have we you know and so we've got to work with what we have and yeah I just think it's a beautiful message for these times for sure let me quickly interrupt the conversation to say thank you that you are here with me on the channel. If you do enjoy what I'm putting out, the in-depth kind of conversations, then why don't you subscribe and also hit the bell button so I can keep you informed with our newest releases. Thanks for that in advance. And let's get back to the conversation. Absolutely. And you mentioned failure. I think failure is something, an interesting one, because failure, if you want to got up the confidence and actually went out of your comfort zone and it doesn't work out, of course, you don't go, told you so, you know, <laughs> you can really say, if you say you can do something or you can't do something, you're, you're right in both cases. This is where I at least teach my, teach my child. But I think the image of failure, has there been an evolution? Because in, in, let's say, I grew up in Europe, and failure is something you don't really want to show. At least when I grew up, it was always something that was like a baddie on your CV. Whereas, you know, in America, you say, you have not failed, you haven't tried. Yeah. So to, to what extent is failure really a very empowering tool that leads you to success? I mean, you know, we have Miss um, um, Huffington, you know, she, she said, I think failure is a stepping stone to success. Right. And, and, uh, and I wonder about Ariana's quote, for me, it is that way. You know, you know how not to do it next time. But for a lot of people, it's still a very big shame factor. Yes, no, you're exactly right. You make a beautiful point. And I think uh, what you said at the start is completely correct. Um, it's culturally nuanced, right? So where I come from in Australia as well, we are not taught to fail and we don't celebrate failure. You know, failure for us is shame and, you know, you, you don't air it, you don't talk about it a lot. Um, so definitely moving to America and being immersed in the, the business scene here has taught me a lot about failure. And it's true. I mean, a lot of the Silicon Valley investors won't look at business people unless they've had, you know, one or two big business failures because they want someone who has uh, learned some lessons and has had to you know, pivot and duck and weave and come up with new plans. So I, I certainly have been on a journey myself when it comes to failure and I'm, I'm trying to impart those lessons to my children as well because it, it is is cliched um, and it's anecdotal, but it is true. You know, when we fail, we learn and that is where the growth comes from. So, you know, I've had to unlearn a lot of stories about failure that I was taught as a child, you know, be it unconsciously or, you know, subconsciously. Um, but, you know, for, for me, it, it, it is about owning our failures and being able to confidently talk about them and being able to share that with others because, you know, when we lose the shame of failure, and, you know, you can get inspired by that or I can get inspired by that. That encourages me to want to live um, more confidently and want to try because if we're taught that you've got to go for this, you know, success and perfectionism at every, you know, at all costs, you, you don't want to talk about the failure. You don't want to talk about the shame of failure. So I think it's important we share the stories and I think it's important that we, we talk about it more. It, it really is. Absolutely. And I think it lifts also the pressure and unrealistic expectations from ourselves. And, and Emma, you know, you are... 
a business woman, you, lo- you, you, you run that global network, uh, business chicks. I also stumbled over that name, by the way. I just love it. Okay, you probably can't. <laughs> <laughs> Take it seriously. And then I saw the people that you attract. I thought, okay, it's a serious business. <laughs> and I, I loved it. But, you know, in your chapter, Running a Business, let us talk about your experience as a leader, um, you know, and leadership in general, what leadership means to you and how you deal not only in terms of failure as a business, but when some of your team members you know, that build this business do fail in an endeavor. This is a bit of a tricky thing. I mean, there's also a limit to, okay, you failed, now you learned, right, second time, third time, fifth time. Uh, you know, yeah, where, right. where's the balance there? Yeah, that's a great question. I think you've got to rewind it back to making sure you hire the right people in the first place, right? And the sorts of people that I look for in my companies are definitely people who are open to feedback. They're willing to take chances. Um, They're ultimately happy to receive some coaching and they understand that whilst, you know, we're not going for perfectionism here and everyone is allowed to make mistakes. We are a high performing culture and we have to get it right the second or third time. So I think it starts with getting the right people in the business um, in the first place. And, you know, I certainly have a set of criteria of people that I, I look for and that I'm attracted to and who are attracted to our brand philosophy. You know, my CEO in the business has been working alongside me now for the best part of almost 20 years. And my very first employee in my company is still with me today, 15 years on. Um, So I think this might tell you a little bit about how we try and put people and culture at the center of everything we do. And to have people and culture as a great part of your um, business relies on really strong leadership. So I've been obsessed with how I can develop my own leadership journey, how I can also help my managers and leaders become really great people people um, that my other people look up to, right? Because that's what we all want. We all want hope. We all want inspirational uh, inspiration, if you like. We all want to work with inspirational people. We all want to, um, you know, have a feeling that there's more to our work than just making money. Um, that's something that I'm very, very committed to. You know, our organization has raised over $13 million for various nonprofits, and that's wonderful. And my people like being able to say that, and they like being able to have their time at work count for something. So, I mean, leadership is, you know, we could spend two hours on just this topic. It's a really yeah. big one, and I hope to write much more about it. But really, ultimately, it's about a journey of self-awareness it's a journey of um you know all the things that we've talked about putting yourself outside your comfort zone to have uh, difficult conversations um it's understanding that leadership is not for everybody it's understanding that leadership does not mean being liked unfortunately you know you are there if you're a leader in your company or your home or your career you have to make the tough decisions and you have to be the one to um stay the course and steer the ship and that sometimes makes you unpopular because you know whilst we're all here to have a wonderful wonderful time we are also here to <laughs> make money right you know yeah and and so leadership is not for, for everyone but you know my style of leadership has definitely been to not micromanage my people you know I believe that they can come to their own conclusions so they'll often come to me and say what should I do about xyz and I'll just say what do you think you should do about xyz right it's people understand and they 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 you know are um you know they're we're all intelligent beings that can come up to our own conclusions and come up with our own solutions. So I'm never someone who stands over the shoulder of my people and says, show me what you're doing. You know, it's, it's yeah. very much about letting people um, be. And, and that's rewarded me with a lot of loyalty and a lot of incredible talent um, throughout and, my And I think this is such a crucial point because it is, you know, okay, it sounds cliche, the empowerment. But I think, first of all, I'm going to nail you there. You have to write a book about leadership because I love your leadership. It is really the kind of corporate culture that I'm also building with my team. And that is to just track the people and give them skin in the game. That it is a co-creation. Because for me, a company is not a name, a brand, or something that just chucks out money, hopefully. Uh, It really is a bunch of great people, minds, ideas, creativity, um, entrepreneurship within a company. I mean, an entrepreneur can be setting up their own business, but they can be entrepreneurial in their own team with whatever they actually think the purpose um, is driven by. And I think this is really a very crucial point. 
It really is. And it makes it more fun for your people as well. You know, when your people feel that they have a voice at the table, when your people feel that their ideas matter, when your people feel like they are valued and included in the conversation, it, it actually it lightens the load for the entrepreneur, right? It, it does that immediately. And it also gives them a sense of deep self, self-worth self and they want to contribute because they're, they're being given that power. It's like you say, it's, you know, power empowerment. I'm giving you the power to make decisions. I'm giving you the power to do whatever it is that you want to do. I mean, we, of course, we have a set of rules of the way things are done around here. We have our culture that leads the way. We have our core values that lead the way, all of that stuff. But, you know, this is not, this is not school. This is, this is not a kindergarten class, you know. So I've, I've just found I, I, I love that idea of empowering my people to make their decisions and to become leaders themselves. And, again, it comes back tenfold to me as the business owner. You know, it really does. I'm, I'm rewarded in many, many ways from my giving up control and not letting my ego get in the way. And, and you know, it's, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful ground for innovation and, and creation because that's what we're here to do, to build and to put good work out in the world and be creative. And, you know, it's, there's nothing more frustrating for me that when I see managers and leaders complicate the process and complicate things by putting, you know, hundreds of meetings in people's calendars throughout the week, um, just so they can hear their own voices. You know, it's, for me, it's not about that. My voice doesn't really matter. I want, you know, I want to hear the whole, the, the whole voice of the whole business. So yeah, I, I will write that book on leadership. I promise you. Oh, good. Okay. That's the deal. That's the deal. <laughs> I want to say the copy. I want definitely. You know, <laughs> And it is so crucial what you're saying because uh, one thing for sure, success is something that we all seek and that gives us confidence to go on, that we have these little, you know, uh, moments of success. But it Mm -hmm. seems that success is not necessarily just, okay, you're lucky, you work hard. There is a little bit more to um, gaining success on a sustainable level. What do successful people you think really do differently? Yeah, it's a big question, you know, and I I agree with you. It's one thing to be successful and another one entirely to stay successful, you know, and um, I can only look at these amazing people that I've spent the last 15 years studying. And I think there's, um, again, some some common themes that emerge. I think highly successful people realise their job is to serve and that means serving their people. It means serving their families. It means serving the community. It means serving their clients. So they have this idea of, you know, I am you know, here here to be of service. And I think that shows up with so many amazing people, whether they be political leaders or business leaders. Um, I I think there is this notion while they're making things up on the fly, while they're experimenting, while they're being creative, while they're doing all those things that that you and I have done um, in our careers, they also, they do play a long long game. You know, they know that things, success might not come overnight. You know, they know they have to keep investing in themselves, investing in their relationships, investing in their people. So it is a long game that we all play. I just said, no one waits except one morning and arrives at success, right? So it's, yeah, here I am. <laughs> um, you know, so, so it's in, in investment. I, I think that's, you know, a, a key thing. Um, and, and having that, you know, short-term plan but a long-term vision is is really, really crucial. Um, yeah, so I think service, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm really fascinated with getting out of our own way and, you know, really working on our own self-talk and really um, studying our own self-limiting beliefs. And we all have them, you know, no matter where we come from, no matter how wonderful our childhoods were. or yeah, it's, Everyone has them. You know, we have these wounds that we carry with us and the stories we tell ourselves. And to be a great leader and or to be a highly successful person, you have to get really, really clear on those things. So I've always had a business coach that I go to and I talk to about my self-limiting beliefs beliefs and you know once they're out of the way I can clear the path and move forward so I, I I think that's a big thing as well I think a lot of successful people have worked on themselves and gotten out of their own way to, to be able to move forward do you agree with that absolutely Emma I have to say I also have a business coach and I would call her it's she's more an emotional coach and we all go through these cycles of yes everything is great and they go like, oh my god no you know you feel <laughs> yeah. really really crap in yourself about what you're doing what is it all for and you just question mm-hmm. everything. And you know, this negative self-talk is something that is really to be managed. It will never go away. I think that is an absolute uh, an absolute wrong idea that you go, okay, click off, never have a negative right. thought about myself. You do doubt. And doubt and fear is something that really can just keep you from even doing the first step or speaking up or just trying it out. And it really is so limiting that you have to proactively seek this is what I did to overcome this because at some point you go like, I'm exhausted. 
I'm exhausted by my own thoughts. <laughs> I'm exhausted myself. <laughs> exactly. I'm really on my own nerve. And in your chapter, you cannot control anything uh, outside of you. Emma, I thought it was just really putting it um, uh, on the spot where this negative self talk and the doubt can keep you from realizing your true potential. Yes, 100%. 100%. The moment that I got clear on that, piece of learning that you cannot control anything outside of you it's like this, this sort of weight lifts from you you know when you liberating liberating oh, the clouds part but it's it's true so, so then the work becomes you know this inner game of okay, okay i get it i get it i cannot control the a pandemic i cannot control the u.s election i cannot control what my kids are going to say or do i cannot control if my people are going to resign i cannot control if i'm going to sign the new client i cannot control if business the share we talked about the share market before i cannot control i cannot control okay great i got it i got it so we all take a deep breath and we go so what can i control i can control my thoughts my feelings and my emotions and so the work becomes on that and then we can emerge as stronger humans that can deal with all this stuff that we have thrown at us every single day so you know it's something that i i have six young children i have my eldest is 11 and my youngest is five months old and it's something that i tell them all the time when they go into you know have conflicts with friends or too much schoolwork or whatever we can't control it guys yeah we cannot control it we can control how we see it we can control how we feel about it we can control our own actions and and it's you know you, you see the lights going off and it's, this is nothing new this is this is not a new no no absolutely <laughs> exactly but it's a shift from victim to winner this is what i yes. tell my i only have one child and i don't want to say she counts for six but hey <laughs> I'm accuser, as they say. so congratulations to your latest one and having six children and your career uh, and you know writing a book and being a speaker emma I mean, kudos. No, not at all. It's, okay. Listen, parenting is tough whether you have one or six. It is, you know, the hardest work we'll ever do. So it's, I don't want people to look at me and think, you know, I have any secret answers or the secret sauce. I, I certainly don't. But, you know, this this is is where it's at. You know, I with my parenting, I, I definitely try and tell myself in every moment, um, I'm doing my best here. I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best. And I let go of that perfectionism and come back to that mantra all the time. You know, all I can do and all I can be in every moment is my best. Um, and I'm completely fallible and I fail all the time when it comes to my parenting, but I, I try and lighten up with it and I try mm. and get back to knowing that, you know, we, we are all doing our best and that's all we can ask of anyone. So Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cheryl Sandberg put it really well in her book, um, you know, and she said, you know, progress is better than perfection. And yes. There are so many coaches out there that really say, listen, the progress is important, the one percent a day, the the repetition, the really in that moment that you make a decision or you do an action that it is the best, really the best you can do. You're not going cheap on yourself or cheap on your kids or cheap on the project or your business. And that is okay. That is absolutely everything that is needed. And if you, you know, compare, you do despair because of course yes. there are people that seem to have it all and do it much better than us. But that's not the point. The point is how you see and, and confront whatever is coming, be it an obstacle or be it something you just cannot control, like the pandemic as well. And it's, it's, it's really crucial. And parenting, I think the mindset, setting the mind right with your kids right from yes. the beginning is where I think we as parents should look a little bit more than just feeding <laughs> or making sure they're going to good school yes. to really yeah. say hey listen look at it differently there are many pers perspectives to look at something many ways to skin a cat yes yeah absolutely and I'm obsessed with that I'm obsessed with trying to bring people into my home that are, have different views and perspectives to, to mine I'm obsessed with having them you know, it's been interesting, like these 15 years of building my company with business chicks, I often say it's been my version of an MBA because to learn from phenomenal people like Diane von Furstenberg and Elizabeth Gilbert and all these people I've been able to, you know, learn from and travel with and spend time with. And, you know, at any opportunity I have, I, I bring my children into those conversations so they can see different perspectives. And I do the same. I do the yeah. same. You yeah. have Victoria yeah. along to business. You listen, you learn, you, you know, you ask. <laughs> <laughs> is that 
Yeah, it's it's great. It's great. So, you know, I'm really grateful we live in a world where we can we can plant people <laughs> around our children so they can see those different perspectives. But yeah, I, I agree with you. It it all comes back to mindset. And and I like you, I have a business coach and I always go into those sessions with a business problem. It always turns, it always comes full circle and turns out to be some limiting belief I have about uh, you know, myself. So I think the work has to be done there for sure. Yeah. Um, another chapter I loved, it resonates with me a lot. And sometimes I get the feeling I'm the only one out there that embraces money. Okay. Not necessarily in a capitalistic way, but one of your chapters is called money is not a dirty word. I mean, I do underwrite that. Do you want to explain a little bit why you felt the need to put this chapter in and what is really wrong in your, in your view with most people, how they think or use money? 